Hello and welcome to Seven Legs of Comic Stash. And we are back with Dollhouse and more Sandman Joy. Sand Sandman Joy? I, I thought we were going over the TV show, The Dollhouse, which was brutally cancelled before its prime. Um, <laughs> fantastic show, by the way, if no one's ever watched it. Um, I know Josh Whedon is unfashionable these days, but uh, him reunited with many of his Buffy alumni for a, for a great old show. Yeah. Anywho, Sandman, you say? <laughs> yes, Handman. Shit, um, better start reading while you talk. <laughs> uh, so, yes, yeah, so our, our big read for this year of like both of us going, fuck me, we, we really should read it. Yeah. And uh, we are now done trade two yes and, and and again it was something that was on both of our lists wasn't it, it it's a it's a, a comic book legend um and something that i have read the first two volumes of before i don't think i've ever made it to the third and, and, and oft rejected but not because of quality because of mood but i think what really helps us this year as well is um us both loving the tv series so yes. we are dedicated and we are going to go through the lot um, but yeah, I kind of don't really want to spoil probably why we're dedicating. We'll go through the lot before we actually get to uh, <laughs> volume two, which is Dollhouse. Yes, but before that, as is tradition, and traditions must be kept. Especially this get... time of year. It's exactly. Christmas time. Let's get in our corners. Happiness just around the corner. Reading corner. Um, do you want to go first? I will get my, my quick ones out of the way first. Okay, yeah, yeah you do quick then, ones. Then, I'll do the then, doodah, and then, and then we'll, we'll come back, back to your special thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, the latest in the One Bad Day run um, was Mr. Freeze. Oh, yes. This... I, did, I did see that come into existence, but I must admit, yeah. I'm, I'm a bit lost on where we are on the releases now, um, and I'll, I'm just waiting for the lot now. Yeah, so, so far, this has been my favourite one of all of them um beautiful art really fucking good story and shows freeze in a way that you always knew was there but is never always done um i'm not going to spoil too much of it because you really do need to read it to to get the full joy of it but yeah yeah my favorite one bad day so far so um in a, I'm going to go sort of semi-interesting twist. Um, were you saying about how much you enjoyed the writing of it? Um, I, and I'm just checking to be damn sure. But um, the writer of this is the writer of Marauders, the thing I was talking about in Reading Corner last week. Ah. Uh -huh. Yeah. And, and I must admit, I really enjoyed his writing starting out. And I think I've read some of his stuff sort of sporadically along the way, but wasn't one that... Um, was kind of on my must um, read list because I think I just read the odd issue here and there. But after reading that first part of Marauders, definitely is becoming a must read. And, and yeah, it makes me even more interested that um, he's doing that one ba one bad day, Mr. Freeze. Yes. Um, second, Deadpool kills the Marvel Universe again. You know, I thought I'd put oh, some yeah, yeah. Marvel in. Well, because we did Deadpool kills the Marvel Universe, didn't we? And I remember yes. when we were recording that, I said, oh, and there's a, a sequel. Uh, and again, yep. but... Um, uh, so yeah, so that's been on the shelf for a while, um, but then I I padded it at work and uh, read it on the uh, DCU or not DCU Marvel U Marvel yeah. Unlimited yeah Unlimited yeah, yeah. Um, and also another quick Ooh, I was going to say very quickly before you go into quick how did it compare um, favorably or did it feel like a bad movie sequel No it 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 tells a different story. Um, it has a bit more of a purpose and a reason for why he's killing. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a decent little run. Um, again, visually really cool. Um, yeah. Lots of death and murder. So what you want with Deadpool. Um, and, and, and something with Kills the Marvel Universe in the title. You, you yeah. should, it suggests there's going to be some <laughs> death and murder. Because <laughs> um, I was on a little bit of a Deadpool kick, I thought, oh, what else can I find that's a short little Deadpool run? And with what you've been talking about, a certain duck character. Oh, yes. I found a King crossover of, of Deadpool the duck, which is where Deadpool 
and Howard the Duck become one. Um, so like the Spice Girls when two become one. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so Deadpool psyche is inside Howard. So you've got a duck shaped Deadpool, um, and lots of violence and chicanery uh, goes off. Um, five issues, I think it was. It was either five or six issues, but really cool little standalone bang for it in an afternoon. It's one hell of a sexy party as well, that isn't it? Getting yeah. in there with the uh, the Merc with a mouth, and uh, I can't remember. Like Howard's got like a kind of moniker to him as well, but I just at the moment just can't put my finger on what it was. <laughs> so yeah, so they they are my my quick ones. What have you been dabbling in your corner? Um, I'm I'm touching back on to, oh, I mentioned Marauders earlier, but because I've been doing this sort of binge of the initial parts of the Dawn of X, um, I wanted to touch on one of, one more of them, which is one that I really, really enjoyed as well, which is the actual main X-Men book. And um, this is written by Jonathan Hickman, who did the Powers of X, House of X, and kind of set up this new status quo. And I think you're kind of always hoping that the flagship title is going to be the flagship title. And yeah. um, in the case of this, I, I think it really is. Um, it It's probably the stuff that is the lead off and the shape of, of lots of the other parts of the story. So, you know, I said with Marauders, it would really help to know the long term, bigger story beats. Yeah. But I think you get a lot of them in this. But um, I, I'd, I'd really highly recommend this. But as I say, only if you've read House of X, Powers of X, and you like it. But, it, I mean, it does some interesting stuff around um, the the initial issue you see. It focuses on, a, let's say, a group of X-Men, but rather than maybe historically the team of X-Men like you used to get. Yeah. It, it's not quite that old team book, but it, it focuses very much on the Summers family. So um, Cyclops, Scott Summers, and um, there's kind of some quite interesting story elements there because they um, move to the moon. So I mentioned that Krakoa is an island and it has tele uh, portals to all different places. Well, they move to the moon and it's a place where, um, spoilers, Jean Grey got killed when she was a dark phoenix. But um, over the years, they've added loads of elements into the Summers family um, and they're all here. So he's living in there with um, Cable, who is technically his, well, is his son. Um, Rachel Summers, who's him and Jean Grey's daughter from an alternate future, the days of the future, past future. Um, yeah. uh, Jean Grey's living in there. Um, the really badly written in kind of third brother that they introduced uh, later on, um, Havoc's there. And probably one of the more interesting and quirky things, which it really sets the tone for Hickman's X-Men and, and how it is um, willing to go into places that certain others is uh, Wolverine lives there. And there is always quite a famous love triangle between him, Jean Grey, and, and um, Cyclops. And, and let's just say it's strongly suggested that that's not a love triangle anymore, and they just love each other. Um, <laughs> and, and you kind of get elements like that, but also it is the book where, as I say, the big story beats happen. There's a, there's a very big um, story moment in issue six around Mystique, um, and it layers in something to do with Destiny, who's a character who's always been um, linked to Mystique and she can see the future. And you get this heavy element that I imagine is going to come back and play later is that as much as all mutants can now be resurrected and they're resurrecting all mutants, there are certain ones have chosen not to. And a lot of the ones that have chosen not to, Destiny being one of them, are people who have precognitive abilities that yeah. can see the future. And um in this issue you get this lovely moment where it's set in the past before any of this happens before destiny died in comic law and she's saying to mystique one day in the future there will be this moment where it looks like everything's perfect and on that day you need to ask them to bring me back and if they don't burn it all down and it's just <laughs> you get bits like that um, but yeah a really good read um jonathan hickman i think is a fantastic writer and i think in, in this as a rather than it being necessarily your old school here are seven x-men follow them and um, there, there are groups that it looks at but it's this is pushing kind of that mutant world but yeah uh, big thumbs up really enjoying this one nice anything else in your corner that that is it for me so my other one i read today is the uh, first trade 
called Family Matters of Invincible. Oh, I'd forgotten that you'd read that. <laughs> so yes, you um, back in back ages ago when you sent me that care package. Yes, yes. God, I forgot I sent it as well. Oh, terrible, my memories. It? And it wasn't until you mentioned yeah. it last week that I went, I think yeah, yeah. I've got that. Let me have a look. And there it was. So yes, I uh, had a read of the first one. Oh, oh, it's good. It is good, isn't it? Weird psycho teacher. Teenagers that finally realise he's got some power. Yeah. Beautiful art. It is so nice to look at, isn't it? I think because I love the story so much, often I forget how beautiful it is. And and I'll, and I'll tell you now, it, it, it remains that level of quality of art throughout. It is fantastic throughout. Yeah, it is definitely one that I am, in the new year, going to be looking to, to probably yeah, grab more of those. Because, well, yeah. Maybe if you do, maybe we'll do a show on it at some point. Maybe we'll get a couple of stories and maybe do a bit of a, an invincible special because you know, like I've said to you before, I really love it. Um, something you said there, I think one of the things I liked about it the most is it doesn't shy away from not only those superhero tropes, but like even your kind of teen TV tropes. Um, but I think just does them really well. And I, I say puts a spin on them. Not everything has a spin, but I think it has a nice. It doesn't feel cheap, doesn't feel lazy no. at all parts. You feel like um, whenever it's being tropey, it's because um, Robert Kirkman loves those tropes. So he's using those tropes in the right way. But, oh, yeah, you're in for a treat, my boy. Because even with that, it was like, you know, him being an alien. But how how they get to the him, why he's an alien. Yeah. And so it's not just that traditional, oh, look, he's an alien that's come to save the world. Yeah he chose to be here and it's yeah. the you're you're a child of a superhero you will have superpowers but they will come yeah you know, they're not born super kids they they grow into it yeah. and i can see so i've not read any further but i can see that there's going to be a lot of the 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 young lad having to learn to deal with getting the powers and having that You've also got obviously the dad that goes off and is a, a classic sort of alien superhero, kind of Superman. Yeah. The troubled mum who sits at home wondering whether they're going to come home at night for dinner. One of the things that's a joy throughout for me of it as well is that um, it really takes care with the cast. So, as much as it is called Invincible, and Invincible is the main character. Um, and and you get more as they come along. You just get more and more, I'd say, side characters or maybe important characters. But none of them are treated... They, they feel like the characters that they're supposed to be. And um, even if some of them disappear for a little while, that you know, they're coming back. There's storyline reasons why they disappear. And um, I can't remember. It's been so long uh, of, of any of the villains that potentially you see in, in um, that first trade. But one of the nice things the series does as well is sometimes you get some villains that seem like villains of the week and they're not because they do come back you know they will play a wider part in the story or have a bigger storyline down the down the way um yeah it always felt to me as, as much as uh robert kirkman will probably forever be most famous for the walking dead and um, for me this is his sort of um the best thing he's done i, I, yeah. I love the walking dead but this is better for me but yeah it's it's definitely one that Shame on me for taking so long to get around to it. Do you know what? I don't think but, you're alone on that, though. I think I think the cartoon existing has probably um, helped it, but it does feel like one of those ones, and you know, you will see it on the shelf in Waterstones, but it does feel like one of those ones that um, non-comic buyers don't tend to have thrust in front of them, and probably people who've picked it up may have come along going, oh, that's the dude who does The Walking Dead. And it's yeah. very unwalking dead, isn't it? You know, like yeah. it, it, it's it's a totally different story. So I do wonder, like, but yeah, I, I don't think it's one that gets probably the accolades and the push that it deserves. Whilst it does still sell well, I'm, I'm not going to say it's a plucky underachiever. But but yeah, you know, it, it doesn't seem to be in that wider consciousness so much. Um, but I'm hoping season two of the, the um, cartoon on Amazon helps push that as well because season one of the cartoon was fantastic. Yeah. So uh, yeah. 
that that's uh, in my New Year's list of. Uh... Well, and also in a New Year's show list as well. So we'll we'll, we'll come back to this <laughs> when you've got maybe a couple of a uh, couple of other volumes under your belt, and we'll 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 talk about um, wherever it is you're up to. We'll kind of cover off the story up until that point and our thoughts and feelings on it. Yes. Gives me an excuse to reread it as well, which oh yeah, I'll never turn down. <laughs> so shall we twist the t- time and uh, go and see our good friend, the Sandman? It's time for the main event. Um, yes, Sandman. So one of the things that we didn't talk about before show, which you probably should have, is. Um, uh, kind of what issues we'd read and I know that sounds a bit daft but one of the things that I think has become quite apparent when um, looking this up is um, I tend to be working off of old because I've got old trades old volumes and I think you know there's, there's been many different kind of reprinting since and um, and because of that the the issues are a bit screwed around but um, but primarily the reason why we said the Doll's House is primarily we're covering the Doll's House storyline here aren't we so whatever yeah. additions you're running on at home um we've got the doll's house because i i know um, and funny enough when i actually um the first one i read on dc unlimited and then um i actually grabbed me old trade out and i realized that the last one we did for volume one in my trade is the first issue of the doll's house so that the, where um, in my 30th anniversary copy of the trade it's just the doll house stuff it doesn't yeah. it doesn't have the Which, which in. kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Because I would say that you could argue, and, and the issue is the, the 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 one where we first, I guess, get introduced to the concept of a, a vortex. A, um, a vortex is it could easily be a prelude to a doll's house, but then because it's a prelude to a doll's house, it fits nicely in a volume called Preludes and Nocturnes, doesn't it? So I yeah. can see the argument both ways. But um, but yeah, we've covered that issue, so we are going into the doll's house rather than covering that one as well. Yes, so um, this starts with the story of Unity Kincaid and Rose Walker. Um, Unity um, was afflicted by the sleep, um, as mentioned in the previous book. Yeah, I think that's um, issue one, isn't it? I think you see that. Issue one or issue two. Because uh, obviously, yeah, with sleep being imprisoned and yeah. no one being able to sleep properly, or people just slept too much, um, and she had a child whilst in the sleep. Um, as you do, as you do, um, which is Miranda, um, who is Rose's mum. Um, Not the last from the TV show. <laughs> have been a very different Sandman story if it was. She'd have been clumsing yeah. about everywhere and drooling over men who work in restaurants. That, that's my <laughs> memory of the show, Miranda, anyway. Um, so, so Dream is in his realm. Um, he is taking stock of all the characters and creations and things yeah. that should be in his realm. And yeah, all of his to... dreams, effectively, yeah. isn't it? Like, um, it, yeah, as you say, this is this is kind of introducing us to um, concepts of, of that world and the idea that um, that there are, I guess, common creatures, common characters, common places that live in other pe- everyone's dreams, but they're all affectations that Morpheus' dream has created. Um, and, and yeah, wonderful for me. Um, it's almost going, here's a lovely Christmas chocolate tin full of all the chocolates you could ever want and pick and choose what you want and, and, you, and use that to make a story. Um, and, you know, we, we know it has a finite element to it, but we also know, like, later on in life, things have been spun out of it. But you can see why, isn't it? I mean, this is universe yeah. building at its at its greatest, and we're only a couple of pages into the start of this story. Yeah, and four are missing. Um, yeah. So we find it then goes back to to Unity, Miranda, um, and Rose because they get sent over to from the states to England to meet yes. Unity. It felt really of its time, didn't it? Um, yeah. And when I say of its time, purely because I remember well, back in in those days, it would oft oft be that plot point in probably bad TV shows, wasn't it? Where <laughs> uh, you'd, you'd 
been called from a lawyer from England. And you go over to find out what this mystery is of why you've gone there, although normally yeah. would have been some murder and Miss Marple coming in. But... <laughs> Um, so yeah, they go over, they uh, speak to Unity, find out that she is absolutely minted, um, and as such, they're not going to have to worry about anything ever again. One um, of my biggest dreams ever. I've always thought that growing up. I wanted someone to give me a phone call and tell me that they were minted. <laughs> uh, but we also get told that there is a brother that is missing, who is yes. Jed. Um, and Rose goes back to the States to go and find Jed. Because um, yeah. Jed um, was stayed with his dad when they split up, uh, when Rose's mum and dad split up. Um, and he stayed with him. Rose went off with her mum. And they want to go bring the family back because the, the dad's now dead. Um, we find Rose in a halfway house or i mean weird... I, I, I thought of it's kind of like a bit like a well i guess airbnb is how <laughs> i describe it these days but it's almost like a like a boarding house isn't it yeah like, um you know you've got an owner but people can rent a room for a short period of time or as we see in this like people who've stayed there for a long period of time it's almost become their their, their permanent kind of address yeah and these are a interesting bunch an eclectic group, aren't they? Yeah. Um, so we have Barbie and Ken, who are... TM, copyright, etc., etc., etc. Yeah. yeah. They're exactly what you think they would be. Yeah. Uh, Chantal and Zelda, the strange goth... Twins? Spider, spider-obsessed spider sisters, twins, lovers, t- sisters, uh, twins. Yeah. yeah. Um... Gilbert, the old man that lives upstairs, who we never see. And the owner of the home, who is a drag artist. Um, And it's just beautiful, this, like, just how random everyone is in this house. And kind of how incredulous, in theory, some of those concepts are, like a Barbie and Ken. your 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 sisters, twins, lovers who wear bridal gowns and obsess over um over spiders and 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 weird creepy things, but they all feel instantaneously connectable to, aren't they? And 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 real, despite being very unreal. You kind of go, yeah. And I even kind of when I'd, I'd love to hang out there. I don't necessarily live there, but I'd love to hang out there <laughs> for an afternoon. Yeah, it's the sort of thing of like, these are all sort of very stereotypical type people that should never be in the same place at once. Yeah. Adds to that kind of quirky flavour as well, doesn't it? Um, I'm I'm probably going to use the the next term about a billion times in this, but in a lesser writer's hands, this is nowhere near as impressive to kind of have these groups and for you to kind of go yeah i, I get it I, I can see it i think in a lesser writer's hand they would be very schlocky stereotyping you go oh, yeah like these people would ever be in the same place but yeah with scant information certainly on early on you feel like i'm, I'm loath to use this term but you almost feel like yes this is a place where kind of that the losers and the unwanted in other places come to find their home and their weird family yeah um, we see Rose's brother for the first time, um, who is in a basement tied up, pissing in a wall. Yeah. But then we then see his dream reality where he is a hero and yeah. everything's great and and this is created by uh, Brute and Glob, who are two of the... Yeah, two of our missing um, dreams. Yes. Um, Great art, by the way, on on the uh, superhero bit. And we'll we'll, we'll kind of do art a little bit later, but I love the jump between that bleak reality of living in the the basement, uh, being abused, to 
um, I guess what you think a, a kid might do, you know, because he's he's the big muscle bound hero yeah. and all that jazz. Yeah, I just I just thought it was a fantastic way of, of drawing me in. Yeah, it is that thing of like it's such a. It makes sense on why he's feeling that in his dreams because of his reality being so yeah so bad. Um, so we find out that obviously Brute and Glob are attacking Jed's dreams, um, and, but, and keeping him concealed, aren't they? Yeah. Like, um, um, Morpheus has kind of had a little bit of an establishment now that he's got a lot of powers and certainly using the dream, he could kind of find where people are, but he can't find Jed, can he? And, and no. you know, it is Brute and Glob that are um, obscuring him from uh, Morpheus's visions. Yeah, um, the Raven is... Matthew. Matthew is all there. Um, get, just sort of, they think that he's a, a special guest or someone else that lives at the house because he's always outside yeah. of Rose's window um, and should start paying rent, which I thought was just funny. Um, yeah. We have a fight between Dream and Glob and Brute's creation of a Sandman. Yes, yeah. Um, uh, and again, you know, like not to jump ahead too much, but um, this is this is why gay. This is why people love this, isn't it? Because yeah. uh, you know, he layers in the um, in in the dream world with the Sandman. He is um, in a almost a Justice League style watchtower, away from everyone else, and he's he's living there with um, with his wife who's pregnant. But then you get this kind of story element where you go she goes i've been pregnant for like two years yeah. and in the ease it's just those extra beats that take this from generic to exceptional for me because you just don't have that elsewhere and, and it, it just adds that i'm gonna say peril but it just adds that bit more investment because you you know as a reader that this isn't real but to to these characters in the dream world it is real and, and yeah. kind of you know, you, you see where this is going. This is really early doors in the story, and it's about Rose trying to find her, well, partly about Rose trying to find her brother. So you know this is going to end, but there was almost a part when I was reading it going, I oh, don't let this end, because what's going to happen to the pregnant wife? Because I was suddenly invested in their unborn child that I didn't know about <laughs> three and a half minutes before I read it. Um, yeah, really loved it. Yeah. Um, see, Dream frees Jed and... Uh, oh, I can't remember what her name is, but the the pregnant woman, yeah, um, from Brute and uh, Glob's control. Because well, um, you you find out at that point, don't you, that um, actually, as much as it's um a, a dream, you know, like he 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 is someone who is dead, um, yeah. and you you get this quite brutal, maybe is the description it's, where it is very harsh. Yeah, what how we're, Morpheus we're, is to her. Well, but, but I mean, Morpheus, like, if we're going to be, like, fully fair, Morpheus tells her the truth of saying yeah. that he, he's dead. He's been dead for the last two years. And if anything, you should be grateful that you've got two more years with him. But, but yeah, like, it, it's equal parts honest, equal parts brutal. I think it's, but, I think it's because he's it's, so blunt. I mean, that's the yeah, thing. Because yeah. how Morpheus is, is written, yeah, he is very blunt. He is very to the point and especially shown in that one where it's like but you're dead you you shouldn't be here yeah you you should be somewhere else and well done you, you you've managed to fool me for a little while you've had an extra couple of years yeah. this is not right which which you know there is um i mean we saw it in the um issue with death which obviously was predominantly a, a, like probably about death. Um, but that kind of idea of going, death is always seen as like the worst thing, but, but you know, it, it, it has a, a universal purpose. But in this case, you've had someone who got to experience more beyond death, but you know, you've kind of, oh, it sounds terrible to say this way, but you've had your fun and now it's, it's time for the universe to be restored to, to its norm. But, yeah. you know, it does leave behind, um, 
um, our, our girl who's who's two years pregnant with uh, with his baby. But I guess you know that circle of life thing, isn't it? Of going, you know, she she's then got the the baby to love. But but yes, um, again, lesser writers probably would have had Morpheus at this point say something really nice. But that's not who Morpheus is because he's neither yeah. nice or nasty. He's just factual, isn't he? Yeah. Um, we then get my favourite one issue. Just as a as a one piece, I fucking love this. Uh, we get Hob, who we see in a pub in yeah thirteen eighty nine. I think is the first year. Yeah, I I think it's thirteen. Yeah. Um, and he says that death, you know, he he's going to outlive. He's not going to die. <laughs> Death is a mug's game, isn't it? Death's <laughs> That's a pretty much game. how it come across. Yeah. yeah. Um, and Morpheus is in there with his sister Death and goes, well, shall we see? Yeah. And, you know, she lets him live. And Morpheus says to him that I will come back in 100 years. And we'll be in we'll this meet in particular this pub. pub. Yeah. Um, and we'll be back in a hundred years, and we'll see where you are, and see if you still want to, you know, go on from there. Well, and, um, you know, those those conceits and a lot of what it, what this is is certainly feeling like um, it's about. And we we said it a minute ago about the the getting two more years, but like this being almost that challenge to someone to say you think death is a mugs game, but you'll regret it. And we'll we'll talk again in a hundred years. And hey, I, it's looking at those, and I'm going to use a term endless because you know that's what these are referred to. These endless yeah. concepts that probably work through our life, but we don't necessarily give them as much thought as we should. Um, but yeah, hundred years. Fast forward hundred years later, and so come back, and he's had a good hundred first years. Yeah. Um, there's the invention of the chimney, which. Uh, <laughs> yes. Is is one of the big things, and um, he's made money, um, and obviously at that point most people are dying off at twenty, thirty years old, so yeah, no one really thinks too much about the fact that he's still alive. Yeah. Um, Morpheus asks him, are you, you know, are you sure you want to still keep going? And he says yes. So they meet again a hundred years later. Um, and at this point, he's even more richer than he was previously. He's had audiences and had the queens stay at his house. Um, he's a is a sir. Um, absolutely loving life at this Done point. Done some, I'd say, shadier things, you know, like a bit of a tiptoe into our oh, bit no, it's, of slavery. It's the next year. The next year is... Oh, is I thought we'd one. done the slavery at this point. No, because um, this is the one where we... Uh, find about a young yeah. actor screenwriter that wants to make himself in the world of, of playwriting yeah and uh, we see William Shakespeare and uh, Morpheus gives him some advice takes him off and uh, yeah, he goes from a, a young... terrible because he's very unconfident, isn't he? He's, yeah. he's like, um, he's there and, you know, he's getting advice on how to be a playwright. It's a bit of a, oh, don't really bother, mate. You're not that good. Um, but, you know, well done for trying. And, and yes, yes, Sandman whispers something into his ear, takes him off. And, uh, you know, that may come back later in the series. But, even, like, in reality, we know what happened to Shakespeare. So, you know, yeah. we know that path. Um, so the next year he comes back and he's... Uh getting into boat building and into yeah. colonization and the the such and yeah this this isn't a a good period of uh, what he decides to do but obviously he carries on for still another loving life years. he's still loving life uh morpheus does mention that you know what he's coming up with is a bad idea but yeah he carries on we then get a terrible year for him um because people now think that he's some sort of a witch burn him burn him as a witch because he still keeps living got arrogant didn't he he says yeah i got cocky and i stayed somewhere too long and 
you know, like I think following like the, the measure of the story, you go from um, people kind of not keeping records and maybe not noticing things like that as much if you move around. And I think you're seeing the world progress and, and certainly you're seeing the world progress and you're finding out it may have progressed a little bit, but my God, people are crying witch at anyone yeah. if they are uh, slightly bit different. Um, but he, again, he's asked, does he want to end it? Says no, so they meet another hundred years later. Um, and this is where we find that people have been paying attention to these uh, centenial meetings. There's been rumours for hundreds of years. As Constantine comes to the pub to find Morpheus and ha Hob um, mid-conversation um, tries to attack them but turns out Morpheus, bit of a badass. Yeah. Um, so they, they get it out. But interweaving, uh, and um, this isn't John Constantine who we find later, but it's uh, an ancestor uh, from that Constantine bloodline. And I mean, bearing in mind, they pack a lot of story into this singular story, don't they? Because you're doing this every 100 years. But taking the time out to, I guess, ground this in a universe that has Constantines in it yeah. and also flesh out Constantine backstory. Again, bravo to, to Gaiman for that. Because he could easily not bothered or made up his own character, but I love that. Yeah. Um, we then go to the 1800s. Um, they think that he's Jack the Ripper. Well, the whore thinks that he's Jack the Ripper. <laughs> yeah. Um, they meet up he has obviously realised the error of his ways about the slavery. Yeah. Um, it's, it's not in the greatest place financially, but is, you know, just getting along. Yeah. Um, and this is when he also mentions about uh, the woman down by the river that had also been over 100 years old. Um, so you hear about other people that are having living for longer than they should. Um, I, we don't know anything more than that. We don't know whether it's, you know, Sandman's meta or what, but... Or, 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 yeah, or what's causing it in this fantastical world that they live in. Um, and at this point, he uh, says to... Hobbes says to, to Morpheus about, well, are we friends? You, you, you do this every hundred years. Why? And Morpheus, in his most sour and blunt way that he does, says he doesn't need friends, he doesn't need people, he doesn't need anything. So Hob tells him, well, I'll be here in a hundred years. Yeah. If you come next in a hundred years time, then we're friends. So we move on to the 80s, the 1980s. And Hobbs there, a few jars down, is about to leave, thinking that, you know, Morpheus isn't going to come. And then Morpheus turns up with a very 80s, new romantic punk <laughs> yes. haircut. Yeah. Looks like he should be in Sisters of Mercy or The Cure or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Hobbs says, ah, oh, so we are friends then. And uh, they then sit and have their pint, and that's where that ends. Um, I love this. This is the one point I'm going to make, talk about the TV show. When this episode was on, yeah, this was the one that I was like, "Oh, this is fucking amazing." Yeah. Reading it, yes, it's only twenty three pages. It's a, it's a one issue. And it got spread out for the 30-odd, 40 minutes for the show. They are both amazing. It almost feels um, like it could be a show in itself or a series in yeah. itself, doesn't it? Like, um, but, but I guess that's the genius of it, is, is to 
to cram this much of um, not only time but but storytelling you know like um you start off with that that early premise of this is uh, death and uh, morpheus almost playing a game um trying to prove a point all of this yeah. stuff and and then as you say as you track it through it morphs from that to actually rather than it be a game for morpheus this is something that he needed but would never have admitted out loud that he needed it and and yeah just just as a a portrait and a look at a character that that we've said in other elements can seem so dour standoffish um that that he does need a degree of companionship somewhere and and he's looking for that um yeah this is i know we said it a bit in that first volume where we kind of patted it on the back for amazing single issues well you know they haven't stopped coming yet have they no two brings us uh and uh, and that's it and doesn't fill out a place we'll get on to what happens next but doesn't fill out a place in this story either does it it no. doesn't feel like you got wrenched out of this story you were enjoying to do something now for something completely different you, you love it um and yeah it, it it weirdly sits beautifully and snugly inside this um story whilst not necessarily being interlinked or interwoven into a lot of the bits that are going on around it but the thing is with this the same with um the one in in book one with in the diner um there are bits of this that i reckon obviously not not got ahead yet there'll be some callbacks i i have a feeling there will be callbacks in this that will play out later down the line well i meant to um i meant to say it when and it was almost the first sentence you said so i thought it's not time to jump in now um but when you talk about um unity um kincaid and and we mentioned it was in that that first um issue like we know again that there's a larger story we know that it it has a, a finite ending but i can only imagine when you were reading this monthly and for example when you get things to like unity kincaid coming back and going oh man there's that person that you mentioned in issue one that could have easily just been a bit of filler background story to kind of what happened in the world but no they play an important part and as we'll get to in a minute an even more important part potentially but and so now i find myself when i'm reading issues to kind of go not only am i enjoying this but what kind of bits of this do i think we're going to see come back later and are going to play a part later um I, I I regret everything it, with the fact that um, I was collecting comics and had found a comic book shop when this was on about issue nine, and I regret that I wasn't buying it monthly at the time. What a foolish child I was. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so we then go back to the Jed Rose uh, part. Um, so we see that Jed was in some very terrible conditions yeah um that his auntie and uncle um on dad's side were basically keeping him locked in the basement because he was free money every month yeah um which sadly is a story that feels um i think probably at the time it would have been the first a young me would have heard of it but it, it, it's not uncommon to hear of this and uh, apologies to all of the stateside uh, watchers but it, it's certainly something you hear and read a lot about as, as something that happens in the states this kind of profiteering off of fostering or having a child in your house and um, yeah. and i don't know getting them to be everything from a skivvy to worse i guess uh so yeah so that's where we see that and then uh we find out that the Corinthian has uh, come across Jed after murdering a couple of people. Seeded, isn't it? You know, we talk about like long-term payoff, but in those first sort of issues, you're getting a a, a page, aren't you? Where um, there'll be like generally in a hotel room, isn't it? And, And someone will be murderized and, you know, we find out that that is this this Corinthian figure, um, and uh, 
it's just it's just grand, isn't it? It's just yeah. meeting out the story at the right pace. Yeah. So that when they get involved, as you say, with Jed, one of the main sort of drivers of this story, at this point you go, no, no, like the, the kids just escaped something horrible. Don't don't link him up with the evil serial killer man. Yeah. So uh, yeah, because he's he's just out of the house. He's finally broken out. And Corinthian comes across him um, trying to get a lift um, yeah. as the Corinthian is off to the serial convention. Yeah. Um, and by serial, we mean serial killers. Oh, Frosties, <laughs> Shreddies, uh, no, not, not No, you're not getting Count Crocula and... Fruit pebbles and fruit loops. I could, I could murder a bowl of cereal right now. Actually, <laughs> I might have one after we've uh, finished recording. <laughs> um, so Gilbert and Rose are on their way to try and find Jed. Yeah, they we, kind of get get this, we get the cheap... soft introduction of Gilbert, don't we? Because yeah. you say, like, uh, for those first few issues, he's just a he, he's someone that they say lives in the um, attic of the house and, and you don't kind of see him but one night Rose is uh, coming home from a club isn't she or um, yeah oh, she's got and, a, a thingy shows um, oh, yeah 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 the drag and, and she gets she gets attacked by some yobs and all of a sudden this kind of broad man with his walking stick comes and saves her and you find out that it's Gilbert who who, who lives upstairs and he, he's very kind of you know, we talk about sort of stereotypes and things where you go like lazy writing, but you like you could kind of argue he seems very stereotypically British gent. Um, Steed from the Avengers is what kept going through my head uh, when I first kind of um, saw him. But 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 yeah, he's he's become almost a a talisman, a knight for 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 Rose. So um, he agrees to accompany her to go and collect Jed. Yeah. Um, and again, by another moment, I'll, I'll just jump into the TV show. Stephen Fry being Gilbert. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yes, yeah, so they off to the, the hotel where the serial killer convention is um, because they get a flat because uh, they've got a really bad car and they're only meant to be there the night before the serial killer convention. But for some reason... They stay a little bit longer. And in the lift, Gilbert sees the Corinthian. It's, which... a, it's a beautifully drawn moment, isn't it? Like yeah. You just, no words are needed because it's just so beautifully visually done. The recognition of someone and then the kind of timid trying to hide away. It's just... Comics at its its height for me. Yes. Um, so he gives Rose a bit of paper that just says something on it, which we don't know yet. But if you're ever in danger, read this out loud. We see some of the absolute scum of the serial killer convention yeah. here. Um, and they're all going by their serial killer names, aren't they? In yeah. fact... Like I, I guess akin to Fight Club or Fight Club comes afterwards, but there are rules to this convention, and you're not allowed to use your real name. You have to use your serial killer name, and you're not allowed to kill on sight because yep, you know, don't like, shit where you're at. Eat. Yeah, don't shit. Yeah, shit where you eat. Um, but you are, yeah, you're introduced to these people, and, and a lot of the time the names kind of give away maybe what they do. But but it is like we talk about a serial killer convention. I mean, this is a convention, isn't it? So they're going to panels about. Um, what it's like to be a female serial killer, how to make money out of being a serial killer. Religious um, serial killers. Yeah, but without it being kind of a comedy. Now, obviously, there is a dark black comedy element to it, but it's not just played up for yucks and larks. The comedy comes from, um, I guess, the sadness of, of what these people are. But, for example, the how to make money. You've got someone giving the lecture of going, well, you know, the police will pay for information, so you can give them information about your kills and do things like that. And you go... I don't know if there's such a thing as a serial killer convention, but I know of conventions and this feels so snugly like what it would be if there yeah. was one. Yeah. It, it stinks of one of those sort of regional sales events yes, for yeah. 
I don't know, some sort of consumer product. So like or insurance are, or something. Here are yeah. our washing machines. Yeah. And and the, the talk should be on the benefits of certain types of washing machines yeah. to your customers. And that it just stinks of that sort of thing, which you see on like so many TVs and films yeah. and stuff. Um, obviously, I've never been to anything like yeah. that before myself. It, it feels it feels but, almost instantaneously familiar without us ever having experienced it. Yeah. We've seen it so much in media. As I say, the, the only sort of convention thing like that that I've ever been to is a beer festival when I worked in a pub, which basically meant going around trying new beers that local brewers had come up with and going, yeah, I like that one, but I don't think it'd sell well in my pub. Let me have another four of them and have a try. And getting ridiculously <laughs> levered because you go, well, I'm not having much of each, but you are. You're having yeah. a pint of each, pretty much. And <laughs> rather than sticking to your pint limit that normally is good for you, you're going, oh, I haven't tried that one yet, and so on and so forth until you're in because your you're, you're only having thirds of a pint at a time. Yeah, yeah. So it's fine. But also, also, you're kind of by the. God, we've, we've gone off into beer festivals here, but towards <laughs> latter part of the evening, you're going, what's the strongest thing you've got? Because you're buoyed by beer confidence at that point. Like, <laughs> nothing can stop you. Exactly. And then the next day happens. Yeah, yeah. Um, Morpheus um, knows that Rose is a vortex at this point. Um, so he is keeping an eye on her. Because and, of and Matthew, you yeah. know, like that's why Matthew was kind of posted yeah. to the house to keep an eye on Rose. Because a vortex will destroy the realm of dreams. And, you know, like we said about uh, where um, uh, the story of, oh God, sorry, I'm, I have actually got it up here to, to remind me, uh, Queen Nada comes like in it and where it could fit in either one is this kind of establishes that initial idea of a vortex. And as you say, like a vortex is, is it once... Was it once every thousand years or once every well, it was century? Once, I can't once, remember. Once a century. Yeah, um, that a vortex will appear. And yes, this vortex can, as you say, destroy the, the, the dreamscape. Um, and it's not really established whether that's intentionally destroy or unintentionally. It's just, it's kind of set as the the big bad, the big, big threat, isn't it? Even yeah. though we're in a um, convention full of serial killers, the Corinthians there, we've been through Brute and Glob, kind of the overwhelming dread is what happens can can everything be destroyed um because i think dream even mentions it at a certain point about how um a planet got destroyed once when he didn't deal with a vortex although that is a little bit later on down the line but but you know th- th- this is your sense of peril but it's rose and we've been following rose for these issues and rose is nice and we like rose and rose is a good mm-hmm. character but yeah you I just find great- a brother yeah, that great sort of juxtaposition between having someone who is quite clearly evil in the more traditional sense of the Corinthian, who sh- who would normally be the bad guy of this whole story, but but you know that even though he's evil, there's a bigger threat, and it's something, it's someone that we like. Yeah. Um, we see Rose is just having a wander around the hotel and ends up mingling shall we say at the she wants to go to disco she wants to yes she wants to go to the disco yeah um so she gets told no by funland yeah it is funland yeah somehow the tv version did not make him creepy enough for how he is in this yeah he is horrific in this and i don't mean like horrific as in you know, Freddy Krueger, like, but he's just icky and yeah. horrific, isn't he? You just kind of go, oh, God, I imagine if I met him, I would just feel grossly dirty after a one <laughs> sentence and need to kind of never be around him ever again. And it's one of those, of like, you can, you sort of know what it smell like. and Yes, the, yes. And, you know, the you, you see what he is on the page and you're like, I Ooh, just smell it and because he goes on um on one of the talks he's talking to one of the other serial killers and is saying about how he has his special place to do his kills 
and how he likes them when they're young and they're easy to get away with. Because he's clearly a child killer. Yeah. And how he then talks to, to Rose to try and make her, in his own mind, younger. Well, it's that gross moment, isn't it? Is. And so many gross moments of this character, but where he turns to the fella next to him and like he kind of goes, oh, I, I like the look of her. How old do you think she is? And I think he says like 16 or 17. And he, and he just kind of... And, and I know he doesn't do it because this doesn't happen, but in my head it was almost like this gross sort of... Mm, but then says, I think she looks younger. And you just yeah. know that, like, kind of his predilection, he's even, like, pushing it on there. Um, so, Funland. I didn't want to kind of go on without talking about Funland. Um, Disneyland. That's everything that I'm getting from this. And, and unless I'm kind of reading in, but, like, all the descriptors of the special place where he finds the kids and all that sort of thing. And, and he mentions it's a small world after all. Yeah. And, and one of the reasons why I wanted to pick up that here is, you know, like when you said, you know how he would smell and, and all this sort of thing. Like that was, and I've never been to Disneyland, but but I imagine it's it's kind of that. I equated it with that sort of sick, sickly consumerism that has been pushed. So, and I know I'm an anti-Disney boy, but like, <laughs> you know, the worst things, you know, when you see the documentaries about Disney and the dark side of Disney and the dark side of Disneyland, uh, this is just spot on equating this character to those sort of documentaries. I, I just yeah. thought this was so well done. Um, and unexpectedly so, because I, I guess I hadn't been... We talk about side characters again. You know, like, we, we know the Corinthians is a serial killer, but I didn't think... In, you know, Funland gets only so many pages and panels in this, but he just feels like a massively fleshed out part of this story in such a, a, a small amount of uh, time. And, and as I say, I think it's that um, Neil Gaiman, what he, what he seems to have this amazing talent for is um, evoking, certainly in me, reactions um, and uh, concepts by linking things to the real world or real yeah. world concepts, like thoughts and feelings that I have. Um, yeah, uh, creepy and horrible, but I, I love the addition of it. I thought I thought he was a fantastic addition to the story. Um, so he tries to attack Rose, um, but Rose uses a bit of paper, calls for Morpheus, and Morpheus calls forth the power of Morpheus. Thundercats, uh... Thundercats, Thundercats, <laughs> Morpheus, <laughs> and uh, then takes him down, saves her. Um, oh, I missed a bit because a bit before this, because we have the, the the special speech. But before this, um, someone is pretending to be a serial killer at the serial yes. killer convention. Yeah, he's um, um he's like yeah. a writer for um, a magazine, isn't he? Yeah, he's, he's he's trying to kind of worm his way into the convention by pretending to be a ser- a, a serial killer that hasn't turned up. Um, who Corinthian know is, knows is dead. Yeah. So that's how he knows that he's not who he says he is. Um, and they take him out into the woods and ritualistically fucking murder this mad guy um, with all of them just getting in on all of their nasty bits. Yeah, they even talk about, don't they, about how much of a pleasure it was sharing their nasty bits with each other because normally <laughs> they only get to do it on their own as serial killers are oft known for. Yeah. Um, so there's then in the convention hall, and the keynote speech, as they would be, is for Corinthian. Yeah. Um, but he it starts his speech and notices someone in the audience, and Morpheus makes his way up to the stage and uh, banishes him um, because uh, he tries to kill him. And uh, Morpheus knows what he's going to do, so stabs him himself. Yeah, Corinthian's a bit cocky here, isn't he? Like, and when I say a bit cocky, you know, he sort of says, you know, you've been gone all this time, and while you've been gone, I've kind of built up my power, and and ultimately, I think I can take you. Um, (laughs) He's very wrong. Yes. Yeah. Um, He then makes all the serial killers live their nightmares of what they've done in the reality. It's it, it's really clever, this bit, for me, because um, 
where they do the serial killer convention, and as we said, like you know, a lot of them are portrayed as as as, as gross or like um, as eerie. But there's also that believability to them, isn't it? You know, by by putting them into a more mundane situation where they're talking about the life of a serial killer, and, and I know a lot of them when they're talking, they're kind of justifying that, and there, there is some leans into kind of are serial killers or killers necessary because they bring a bit of anarchy to life to move things on and things like that and you could i think e- easily argue that um for parts of this some people could read that and kind of go oh they're not so bad are they whereas that morpheus kind of speech where he's you know he ultimately that's what he says he says you think you're not so bad You've convinced yourself by lying to yourself that you do these things for a right and just reason and you are right. And even when you think you're wrong in your dreams, you then tell yourself that you're right to justify these bad things you do. Well, for punishment, you're going to see the reality of what you've done. And if, if you would ever do anything again. And, and I think it's just that great point where you go. Yeah, if anyone was leaning into this and getting a little bit seduced by the serial killer convention, yeah, here is our hero um, saying, no, no this matter how much, is. what you've just seen is their warped sense of reality. So don't fall yeah. for that because they're actually horrible. And Which, uh, yeah, just great think, storytelling again. I think is one of those of, I think at this point, Gaiman might have been living in the States by then. I reckon he is, yeah. I reckon he's um, stateside. And it's very much a outsider's view of the States, because obviously if you think how much the serial killer is lauded over there yeah. and and there's yeah, that I've whole become praising famous. yeah of them that that an outsider's yeah, that move from, in, that of, move from infamy to kind of hero worship. Um, yeah. Which I said can only be really done from an outsider on that. Um, but that's, Morpheus... I mean, that's, that's the thing though. This isn't even the end, is it? You know, no. like that, that is the cap off, isn't it? Like the Corinthians got and all these serial killers kind of come to justice. You could almost go, oh well, there you go, turn it over. That's that story done. But of course, then you remember, no, it's not that story done because you've got the vortex, you've got Rose, and, and you just go, bloody hell, there's another very important chapter to come. Bring it on. Yeah. Um, so, Dream or uh, Jed is in hospital because um, he has suffered a beating, um, probably at the hands of Corinthian. Maybe yeah. Fun Boy or Gilbert, Funland. Um, we don't. Gilbert rescues him from the uh, boot of Corinthian's car. I think it was, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Gilbert. It was Gilbert had. Car. Gilbert had left, hadn't he? He, he? When he gave that note to um, to her with Morpheus, as you said. Like he kind of um, gone um, and left us, and like kind of the heroic night had disappeared. But you see his triumphant return, rescuing Jed. And I say triumphant, he just kind of walks on panel with Jed in his arms. But you know, yeah. like that kind of no Gilbert is a good guy. You know, he he clearly has something with Corinthian and, and wanted to leave. But no, he, he couldn't stop himself. He still had to do the honourable thing and and save the boy from the boot of the car. Yeah, and. Dream then informs Rose that she is a vortex. Um, in the the world of in the dream realm, um, explains everything to her, tells her about the fact of you know a vortex that he once never stopped, as he said yeah. earlier on, that destroyed a, a destroyed planet. a planet. Yeah. Um, and basically says you we're gonna have to kill you. That's the only way to stop this. And it's it's that beautiful um, use of that concept, isn't it, of the um, what's worth more, the one life or, in this case, like billions of, of yeah. lives. And, and, you know, you as a reader, you, you've grown to to like, love or certainly have an affinity with, with Rose. And you know that ultimately um, on paper, she's absolutely innocent. She's done nothing to put herself in this position. She's done nothing bad as such. But now this ultimate ending for her kind of has to happen. Um, but even then, the way she's written, you know, like she, she asks questions and kind of does that. Not, not begs, but, you know, like kind of pleads a bit of going, no, yeah. you know, there's got to be another way. And all those things that I feel like if you were a human, 
put in this position if you were human. So if we are humans, <laughs> <laughs> just to clarify, we are humans. But if we were put in this position, like maybe how we would react. And yeah. it felt very realistic as to what she went through in this conversation. Um, and go back to Morpheus. You know, Morpheus is ultimately doing a necessary thing here. But there are points where I'm reading it and I'm going, oh, don't be a bastard, Morpheus, figure it out. And then, uh, and then the next panel I'm going, but he's right. You know, like you would want to yep. save everyone. And um yeah, great. I, I, I said it. I said it multiple times during this already. Great storytelling, and I think that's where great storytelling really does come from. Is you're not only reading it and enjoying it, but you're getting so caught up in it that you are asking yourself those questions of what would I do? But not only what would I do if I was Rose, but what would I do if I was Morpheus? And everything is pulling you in and, and asking you things about yourself and maybe yeah. how you see the world, the universe, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we see Gilbert. Yes, Gilbo's back. He tries to do the honourable thing and says, well, well I, I will take her place, kill me. Yeah. Um, and we find out that Gilbert can't be killed because he's not a human. He's a place. Yeah. He is Fiddler's Green. It's brilliant, isn't it? I've yeah. got, 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 got to find some more words to describe, but brilliant, excellent, great. Blah, blah, blah. But I just fantastic i don't think i've ever um mm. seen anything else that did this this idea of this this character that and i'll be honest i loved gilbert i maybe it was the stephen fry-esque or seeing him as stephen fry yeah. later that was a big selling point but i instantaneously loved him and only wanted good for him and um through parts of it i was thinking don't be a bad guy don't be a bad guy but but even that, the, the fact that he ends up just being, um, a, as you say, a place, but a place that we all go to in our dreams, but a nice place we yeah. go to in our dreams. And it just made sense. You just went, oh, God, that's probably why I loved him, because I feel that affinity with the happy place I go to when I want to go to a happy place in a dream. Yeah, and it, it it's also just how, again, I, I don't know if Neil Gaiman had an idea this had ever been done as a TV show or whatever, but it's that speech that Gilbert gives just before he goes, turns back into Fiddler's Green, where he says, at any point you can come and sit under my tree, rest yeah. in my meadow. Yeah. And it just, and it, it's like, I, I generally think it is sort of the sort of thing is like, yes, this is what Stephen Fry yeah. built for Stephen yeah. Fry yeah. like on the page. And it's just, so so good. Um, Rose sort of starts to understand that she thinks she yeah, she she is going to have to die so they can get rid there's of some, the the vortex. There's some elements of that kind of cycle of grief thing, isn't it? Like here, where um, as much as she's not technically going for the cycle of grief, but you kind of see the the argument, the the denial, and ultimately, as you say, coming to that kind of acceptance of going, I have to accept this. Um, yeah. And I guess in that um, cycle of grief, the idea is you accept and move on, whereas she's, I guess her move on would be death at this point. Yeah. Um, but we then find out that Unity, back in the real world, has, is dying and is yeah. literally about to die. And she appears in the dream and Morpheus has uh, or tells Morpheus that she should have been the vortex but due to her being in the sleep and, and him being captured you know like yeah. uh, due to like the whole part kind of uh, beginning bit of preludes and nocturnes that this was prevented the yeah, natural order skipped. didn't happen, yeah, the way that it should have. And it skipped two generations. Um, so they kill Unity, or Unity dies. It's, it shouldn't say killed, because it's a, it's, a, it's a good, noble death. It, yeah, because it is odd, because like, it kind of, she is killed, but it's not in a... <laughs> shower yeah. scene kind of way is it it's a, a natural kind of progression um almost a peaceful death isn't it like yeah. the 
um, the sacrifice of yourself, I guess, um, is the, probably the best way to describe it. And uh, we find out that Rose is now free to leave because she is no longer the Vortex. Um, we then go back to Rose a few months later after the, the events, and we find out that her best friend died in a diner. Love this bit. A Love few this. months ago. Um, after she broke up with her girlfriend. Yeah. So call back to the diner issue of a few in the last book. And you see um, the headline from the newspaper, don't you, which talks about the, the, the diner killing as well. And you, you just go, I know it's your own material, mate, and you're playing in your own story, but bravo. Yeah. You know, like, uh, so you could argue, like, um, like, would this, is it necessary for the story? No, but it elevates the story because you just go, yeah, you've got this whole kit and caboodle planned out and there will be very kind of minor links, major links along the way. But, um, but yeah, just, it was, it was a, such a, oh, I keep talking about joy, but such a joy when I read that bit and I was just like, oh God, yes. Clever, Brilliant. clever callbacks. Yeah. yeah. And that's why I think some of the stuff that we've had, we like with the with the pub issue. Yes, I could I could see there being something, whether it just be Shakespeare, where whether it just Hob Hob turns up again, but with what we've had in just these eighteen or sixteen issues, I think. Yes, yeah, sixteen. The two yeah, books. Yeah. What we've got in just this, I'm just oh. Do you know what? It feels like we've got more, though, doesn't it? We say yeah. about 16 issues. This feels like um, it feels like I've read 50 issues at this point. Or I guess probably the truth of it is, is that I think other people would take 50 issues to pack as much as this in, uh, yeah. story-wise. Um, so Rose d- decides that she's going to leave the house and go out and She's been stuck indoors since the, the meeting with Morpheus. We then go to Desire's realm. And we find out that Desire been naughty. had been very, very naughty. And she was the reason that Unity had a child. And would have known that if Morpheus had killed Rose, all hell would have broken loose because the Endless cannot spill the blood of the Endless. Yeah. Um, Dream warns Desire about plotting against them and uh, leaves. It's great though, isn't it? Because like you, when he does that, um, the way that they portray um, desire is like have having been scolded and was properly scolded and was afraid. Yeah. And then you flip the page and you kind of go, nope. Nope. I'm nope. still going to fuck. Yep. And that's that thing. Of like, I, I'm like, I, I know we've had a little bit of desire here and there through this, but I, I feel that from what we've had so far, Desire is going to be our big bad at and least that, for a while. That wider concept of um, building out on the Endless, because you know, they, they, they've mentioned it a few times now, but uh, the, 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 the one who's gone um, and things like that, and you kind of go, okay, yeah, this is ultimately going to be probably fleshing out Morpheus, but about um, the Endless, the trials and tribulations of this what you would describe as a strange family, but really any stranger than any other family. It's just that the games that they play are universe <laughs> bending games. Whereas like, I guess in your own family, it might be more petty things like how do I get someone to make us a cup of tea rather than how do I set up a hundred year chain of events that might cause um, their the downfall of the destroyed. world. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, but but I think that's that's kind of the the beauty of some of this is that um, when you look at the endless and what we've seen so far, and as much as they fit the archetypes of the concept that they are, so desire and dream and death 
um, they feel equal parts above us and aloof, whilst also feeling very, very human. They yeah. have the same sort of base needs and the, the same sort of um, ability to make the base mistakes that we do as, as humans. Um, but I guess when they do it, it has potentially a lot uh, more dire. Massive consequences. But also, also, on the flip side, you know, can do amazing things as well you know can, yeah. can can shape the world in a positive way or can can destroy it in their petty little games yes um so i'm gonna say you didn't like this Ooh, yeah? before before we um <laughs> go into like and dislike i just wanted to jump back one issue um, and okay. purely because it was a bit that i really really liked um um so between um uh the 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 unity um element and um uh, this desire um part where we look at rose in her house and you get that um uh in in the, the sorry when when she's at the home when they're doing the dream vortex let's go back to issues my apologies where you start to see inside the dreams of the people who live in the house oh yes yes yeah and, and do you know like again it could easily feel ancillary and maybe trying to drag the story out but i love this uh, maybe it was the art and it was the concepts but you got to see what um barbie and ken were like in their dream life and um um the uh, the, the sisters in their dream life and I, I, it's just pat on the back stuff because it it just fleshes out because you had they had their moment didn't they you know they were in the house and they could have easily gone yeah that's fine we'll never speak of them again but you know you come back and you drill down into and i guess why i wanted to pick up on it is in some cases like with ken um their desires and i think it's almost that a eh? a eh? yeah. desire might have something to do with this and and uh, yeah I, I just thought a fantastic um not to like kind of the level of, of, of pull you out issue and, and, and smack you around the face with greatness that the um that the hundred year gap one was, but in that similar mould of going, this could have not been there, but the story is so much better for it. Yeah. Um so as I was saying, as as an overall Yeah, you're right, you, I didn't like it. Yeah, it's a shit in it now. Um this this is fucking like amazing. What, what what's the matter with me, Chris? Why didn't I take to this the first couple of times I tried to? And I've tried like over the years, probably like once every five to ten years. And a, a lot of the time, I, I I've stopped after Preludes and Nocturnes. But I have read The Doll's House a couple of times, and, and I I just I don't understand. Having read it now. I've no idea why it has never grabbed me like this before. I think the closest I've got to before, and I never disliked him. I just kind of went, yes, yeah, all right, but I don't really think it's as great as people go on about. But but this time round, ah. Oh, See, is, is, isn't it? is this, I mean, with this one, it might be, because we've had the TV show, that it's given, for you, it's just given you that, change of medium maybe that grabbed you because the as we mentioned in the first one the tv show is fucking amazing yeah yeah that see that you're seeing it from the other way so so you've got the tv version and you're jumping back to the original source yeah i mean it could be because because there is a correlation isn't there obviously like i have watched it now and i'm enjoying it so much more i mean i i the only thing i lean into in my head is um where I am as a human being and maybe when I have read it before I've not been the right human being for it I yeah. know that sounds really weird but like where I've been with my what I'm liking at the time or where I am in in, in my life I, I just I just wonder whether I wasn't ready for it at the time um, it reminds me of the wire which is what and not in any way like the, the, the story plot or anything like that yeah. um, but I I tried that five times five times i tried i kept hearing how great it was and five times i tried it and i i think the furthest i got to was episode three and every time i just kind of gone ah oh, yeah yeah it's kind of there um and then oh god i probably had a week off at a certain point and i went no nah, bollocks watch the whole first series and then kind of judge it on that because enough people are saying it's it's good 
you know, maybe it grows on you. Um, it's my yeah. favorite TV show of all time. I love it. And and I just, and I, again, I go for those same pangs of going, why didn't it resonate with me at the time? But yeah, may, as I say, maybe it's just, you need to be, or maybe it's me. I need to be in the right frame of mind when I come to stuff. But um, yeah, I, I think, I think something like this, as we've said, there's a few other bits that we've had that have gone, oh, I wouldn't give it to the kids. I wouldn't give this to Will. No. I think no. I think you need, again, it's like our oh, visions. When we yeah, said about visions, yeah. you need to have lived a bit yeah. for it to resonate. Yeah. Um, you know, like we said, like, let's, let's pick one particular story facet. We were talking about the um, let, let's use the term confrontation between Rose and Morpheus at the end where um, you're going you need to die for everyone else to live and I think superhero me or young me I don't think I could have grasped that concept I think I would have well I say grasped that concept that's a bit of a lie I think I could have grasped it but I think I, my lean would have been no yeah this shouldn't be happening this is wrong whereas i think you know you you've lived in your own body in this world a little bit longer and you kind of go life ain't fair and this is a reflection of that but but not horrifically it's not like bitterly the only lesson you should take from life is life shits and then you die (laughs) this is more going you sometimes a sacrifice of yourself can do so much for other people uh, yeah maybe mentally i wasn't at that point but yeah i'm with you i wouldn't give this to um well i said i wouldn't give this to a young reader i wouldn't give this to a young reader unless they are kind of one of those young readers who seem older than they are you know, has an old would, soul yeah. yeah yeah so yeah um and, and yeah first time out i tried it i was young you know i would have been 14 15 and um I don't know, a lot of 14, 15 year olds probably did buy into this because maybe it just did grab them. But but that was too young for me. And I wonder whether that did re- like colour subsequent reading. So maybe some of the other times when I tried it, I, I couldn't help but remember what 14, 15 year old me was feeling when they read it the first time. Yeah. But yeah, no, as I said, um, I am all on this. Um, so yeah. in January, we will do trade yeah. free. Um, and. And, you know, like I, I said, this is uh, something that I almost felt like I had to read because I'm a comic lover and it's this famous run. And I, I go back to maybe I put too much pressure on it because of that. But at this point in time, I don't think there's anything that gaming can do in the rest of the volumes, which won't make me go right the way to the end. Because yeah. this is a, a, amazing. And for anyone who's ever said to me, it's amazing. I kind of went, ah, not for me. Uh, and because of that, I hadn't really experienced it. Um, you know, just so you know, yeah, I'm on that train. This is amazing. Um, I, I can see why it is one of one, if not the most revered runs of all time, because it is. We, we talked about world building earlier. This is universe building and and grounding and it, it in in those thoughts and and concepts that impact our everyday life. Um, yeah, amazing. And this is the thing, as you said like earlier, this is, if you've got the one that you have, it's issue uh, issue 9 to 16. Yeah. The one I've got is 10 to 16. Yeah. So six issues or so. This does more than what Nightfall did in, what, 20-odd issues? Yeah. That in Night Quest? Yeah. And yeah, has, Krems, more depth, right. has more depth, has more believability, builds more world, and has a single hit for the yeah. the hundred years. It has half an issue of what the rando housemate's dreams life is, yeah. which you care about because they've been built up in three pages yeah yeah but because of how they're written and how it is you you're bought into them it is it, it's one of those i think gaming might you know become someone that i'd look at even more of his stuff because I've, I've done 1602 i love um oh the 
good omens at the yes. top. Um, he did uh, Coraline, which I love. He did um, oh, what's that? Starlight or Stardust? Stardust, Stardust. Yeah. yeah. Um, everything of of his that I've seen in some form of medium. Is so fucking good, and he builds worlds and characters so well that yeah, I'm I'm all on on a with Finn, definitely going through Sandman, but I do think next year we may also have to look at other gaming projects and uh... yeah, I mean, um, I think uh, the truth of it is, is as much as he's um, around comics and, and and does does comics. That's the wrong term, but I think you know, like this is probably his biggest comic endeavor, and and the truth of it is, is that I think probably his best stuff post this is in novels that are then adopted into TV shows because, um, I, I mean I've read I think four of his his books and they're a, they're brilliant, and, and and partly again you could argue well why the hell didn't you go back and read Sandman because you've read stuff of his and you love it, but um. But yeah, I, he can. You said it like well building, universe building, um, and you know, it, it's always or, or everything I've read is grounded in fantasy, um, but and and leaning into some real world stuff and, and lots of different mythologies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but he presents them so well, he interweaves them to the point where you just it almost feels like, uh, like when I was reading this, as I said six issues, seven issues. Bad, rock, bad candy, however many issues. Um, I it felt like fifty, but in a great way. I also didn't want this to end, even though I know there's more to read. I didn't want this story to end, and there were parts when I was going through it where I kind of almost convinced myself this is what happens in the real world. This is what happens in the world outside my door. They are there, and and yeah, he just absolutely um pulled me in. So yeah, I'm. I'm down for more gaming. Um, I certainly think from my perspective, there's a dramatic difference between what we're reading here and what we got in 1602. Yeah. You know, and that's not to knock 1602, but this is so far elevated above what we got in 1602. Oh, by, by a country bloody mile. Yeah. Um. But yeah, no, I, as I said, I really enjoyed 1602. I know you weren't as as hot on it as I was. Yeah, I mean, I think, again, a bit like it was a decent Elseworlds, to use a DC term. But um, yeah. I think probably for me, you know, I've, I've, I've seen loads of them before. And, um, and, and you know, as I say, you're coloured by your other experience. And because I'd read a few of his novels by then, coming back to reading 1602, I kind of go... Oh, I felt like you had more in your locker, um, <laughs> but also you know it's a it's a certain amount of issues. But um, but yeah, I will be interested. I, th- I think we'll go on a bit of a game and comic book binge, binge just to see whether anything out there kind of comes close to this again. And um, we'll we'll get introduced to um, some of these characters as we go. But as we know, there's some relatively modern uh, or modern new. Um, takes the stuff from the Sandman universe, but also um, around that time in Vertigo, there are I'm going to say some spin-offs, but some of the characters from this get their own series and further stories. Different writers generally, but yeah, I, I'm, I, we've got DCU, we've got DC. Um, what the bloody hell is it called? I, I, now I can't Infinite. remember. Infinite, Infinite. I wanted to say Ultra because uh, Chris, I might upgrade this to Ultra. Um, no, I, um, I, 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 we've got it there. So I kind of now want to go. Let's see what else there is in in uh, that expanded universe. Yeah, um, but yeah. So once a month we will do a yeah. number one. Um, well, until we get to that heartbreaking point where it ends. Well, I was gonna say I, I've got another three giant books worth to but, go. But, but you know, you know, like um, as I said, I didn't want this story to end. There's a part of me that goes, and let's let's play fair here. This could go down the toilet. I don't think it does. But it could go down the toilet, but I'm already two volumes in, going. I don't want this story to end, and I do love a story <laughs> with a beginning, a middle, and an end. You know, as much as I we talk about sequential superheroes, we talk about X Men earlier, which is like I think that was volume five of 
of X Men, but that's X Men as a singular title, not including Uncanny X Force, New Mutants, and things like that. Yeah. But I do love a story that has um, that the creator gets to tell in its entirety. But God, yeah, I'm not ready for this to end. But it's all right. We've still got sixty-two issues. I think it is. I think it's eight. I think it's eight. 84 in total yeah. or something like that it'll, it'll fly so, by though wouldn't it so we've God, still got me old negative near the year oh, it'll be over before we know it so we've still got plenty so yes we will return with more sandman in the new year yes um but until then well down there. sorry just just very quickly before Ooh. we do until then um just as, as, a, as a bit of a plug for something we're going to do kind of end of year, we're going to do uh, something akin to an end of year awards, aren't we? But um, because we are not kind of current issue readers generally, one of the things that we're going to look at is, you know, like top fives of our favourite things that we've, we've, we've read this year. Um, so um, if you've got any sort of top five things you've read, this year or, or new to you doesn't have to be new pop that in, in in the comments and and i say that here not to give any spoilers but the way we've talked about this i, I feel like this 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 may be talked about again in our top five at the end of the year <laughs> i don't know what you were thinking no, no, no. spoilers spoilers um but yes what you think of dollhouse down there as well um as always like subscribe and, tell. and if you haven't read it and what we've said isn't enough to convince you please read this it's fantastic it, it really is um by hook or by crook find a way to read it um it, it, it's it's well worth your time yeah um i think because of the tv show the first two trades um so basically everything that's covered in the first season um is one edition now of the of the new ones um because that's what i got for for us um as soon as the tv show was done i was like oh they have new ones it's not all individual issues it's not individual trades it's just done as four chunks of books um and it was like 15 quid and you won't spend about 15 quid yeah yeah but until next time like, subscribe, ring the bell, and get your Sandman on. And until then, goodbye. Bye.